Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Ray. I'm an alcoholic. In the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, after, uh, immediately after what John just read, the A, the B, and the C, the next line in the book is, being convinced we were at step three. So it is a prerequisite to the third step that I be convinced of step one and two as it applies in my life. You know, a lot of people should stop drinking. There are really a lot of people in the world that ought to stop drinking. There are some guys who get drunk four or five times a year, and they're a real pain in the ass when they get drunk, and they grab you by the lapel, and they blow stale beer in your face, and they tell you a lot of ridiculous stories, and uh, they ought to stop drinking, these guys, because it, it just it makes them a little unbearable. And some guys uh, drive a car drunk, and uh, they have an accident, and they make the connection between the accident and the fact that they were driving their car drunk, so they stop drinking. These people are abnormal. When an alcoholic cracks up his car for the fourth time because he's been drinking, he buys another car <laughs> and complains about the car that he wrecked. It was not a good car. Uh, there are people in this world who drink and get sick and they, they puke and they stop drinking. They have no stick to <laughs> Alcoholics learn to, to be comfortable drinking and puking. And, uh, and they carry on with it. They stick to it. They have uh, they have a purpose in their drinking. So we don't get those other people like that. People who can't uh, can't handle booze and they, and they quit it and they just put it down. We don't get that. We are convinced, I am convinced that I was powerless over alcohol. I never could drink it. I knew what to do with it, but I just couldn't drink it anymore. There might have been a point once in my life I could, but I couldn't anymore. And being powerless as I was, it puts you in a terrible position because there are people who come to AA and when they get to the second step, by this time they haven't had anything to drink for some period of time. And they begin to reassert themselves. They're not really the same person that walked in here or was dragged in here or thrown in here begging for help. All of a sudden, after a period of not drinking, they begin to think. And that's bad for an alcoholic. And so they get a little obstinate and they dig in sometimes and they will not believe that there is a power here that can restore them to sanity. And those people who do not come to believe, I think, really just don't want to believe. And that puts them into a terrible position because if I am powerless as I am over alcohol and I don't come to believe that there is some power here that is going to help me, if I don't believe that no human power can help me, I'm in a terrible fix because I remain powerless with no hope that I will ever find a power greater than my own. And if I had dug in at the second step, there's only one thing left to do, and that would be to drink. And of course, if I drank, then I would have died. So I am convinced, first of all, that I'm powerless over alcohol, and secondly, I came to believe that there is a power here that can restore me to sanity. I have that belief, not because anybody lectured to me that I must believe. I believe it because it, I experienced it. I believed it at the very first because I had gone a period of time. I don't know what it was, three months, six months. And I had not had anything to drink and I didn't want to drink. And whatever was doing that for me was certainly a power greater than my own. It wasn't necessary for me to to name it or define it or give it a, a, a face or anything like that. I believed it because it happened. It happened to me and I saw it happen to other people. 
I believe my sponsor. I believe people in my group. I believe a lot of things. And I was convinced, and I am, I remain convinced, that there is a power here greater than, certainly greater than my own. And that brings, uh, brings me to step three. When I was presented with this at first, I, of course, looked at the words of the step, made a decision to turn my life and my will over to the care of God if I understand him. And frankly, it didn't mean a great deal to me. It sounded fairly mystical. It also sounded difficult. I don't know how you do that. But I have a sponsor, and he put it to me this way. It was not in any way connected with theology, or even in the beginning about, it was not connected even in the beginning about God. He said, first of all, look at the step. It is written in the English language. It's not in Egyptian. It's not in Albanian. You can read it. And it doesn't require you to turn over anything to anybody. All it requires from you, he said, is a decision. Make up your mind. The way he put it to me was, you can make up your mind now, he said. You will either stay in, as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you will take my direction as your sponsor, or you can go back where you came from. It's up to you. Make up your mind. Which do you want? Well, that was easy. That was very easy. Because I couldn't go back to where I had come from. I just couldn't go back there anymore because I couldn't manage back there. I was not managing my life back there. I had an unmanageable life back there. The terror and the fear was back there. And I was afraid, I really was afraid to go back there. I wasn't so sure what this involved, this decision, but I knew from the short time I had been here that whatever was here or anywhere else for that matter was certainly better than where I had come from. So I said, all right, I'll make up my mind. I'll, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to do what you, what you tell me to do. He said, good. I said, what about God? He said, well, we'll get there. We'll get to God. He said, I don't know if God's ready for somebody like you. <laughs> I don't think, uh, I don't read the stuff to say that I make a decision to turn my life, give my life over to God. What would God do with my life? Guy comes into his office. The guy says, uh, O'Keefe just gave you his life. I said, thanks a lot. That's wonderful. That's, I really help things here. If he's finished with his life, we call him. <laughs> we gave him his life. If he don't want to live his life, bring him back up here. No. I says, I don't think he means that. And I did. That the step doesn't mean that. You don't give yourself up to God. But you do make a decision to put your will and your life into the care of God. You ask him to have a care for you. The Quakers have a wonderful expression. I, at one time in my religious career, was a Quaker for a while. And uh, when, the, uh, when they are worried about one of their members and somebody's having a problem, they just say that we have a concern for him. And at the meeting, they will say, let us have a concern for him. Poor Joseph, because he has a problem, I want to be concerned about him. And that's what I has, I understand this, this step to be. That we make this decision to stay here. And I understood that the thing that got me into most of the trouble I was in, if not all of the trouble I was in, was my will. I understood that. I understood that I had been self-willed from day one. And the trouble with somebody like me was that in the beginning of my life, I have a very strong will. I still do. And my will and my determination in my younger years propelled me into a successful lifestyle. No matter what the obstacle was that I was presented with in my earlier years by force of my will and my determination, I overcame that obstacle, and I did it without regard to anyone's feelings 
or anyone else's wishes or desires. I was self-willed. I was self-propelled. And I did that so successfully that I spent my 35th birthday in a mental institution for alcoholism. But for the first period of time, that will of mine got me going. It got me out of the streets. It got me into the schools. It got me out of the schools. It got me into a lifestyle. And I was used to being self-reliant. I was used to being on my own. I was used to depending only on myself. And I can truly say that I really did not depend on anybody from about age 12 to age 35. I did it myself. And I screwed it up myself. There was nobody else I could point at and blame for my accomplishments or lack of them other than myself. And the book tells us very clearly that selfishness, self-centeredness, that is our problem. And that was clearly my problem. The book doesn't say often, once or twice only, the book says that the alcohol is going to kill us. But the book is very, very clear that self-will will will kill you. Selfishness, it says, we must get rid of self-centeredness or it will kill us. And this step, this decision, is really the key which opens the door of Alcoholics Anonymous and the the form in which it takes is willingness. We use will in a variety of ways in Alcoholics Anonymous. We say of someone who's acting badly, he's very willful or very self-willed. But we say of someone who's acting well, he's willing. He's, he's willing to do it. He's willing. He wants to be here. He wants to get sober. He's willing. And that's what we're talking about here is this form of will. What will you do if you're new and you face this third step? What the step is saying to you, make up your mind about how you will live. Your will and your life. How will you live? Obviously, in my case, and probably in your case, the way you had been doing it before didn't work. The self-will, which I had, worked up to a point. But there came that inevitable point or anyone who has a disease of alcoholism, where the will itself, the self-will, it becomes a destructive thing. And we must be rid of it, the book says, or it will kill us. So that's how we put it to me in the beginning. How will you live? Now, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous the second time in 1965, asking for help, begging for help. And in a very true sense, the first day I walked in the door, I asked somebody to take my life, which was unmanageable, and help me with this. So in a sense, in the beginning, the first day, I had made some type of a decision on some level that I would take the instructions of Alcoholics Anonymous. And in the beginning for me, it was really just the drinking that I was concerned about. I wasn't really concerned with the rest of it. I was practically 100% concerned with drinking. I didn't want to drink because I knew from my experience with drinking that if I continued to drink, I would surely die. And in that sense, I really had made up my mind that I would get some help here. So when he put this decision to me that way, it was easy. It really was easy. And if you knew, I suggest that to you. Just think about it. Do you want to stay here and follow the suggestions of Alcoholics Anonymous? Do you want to get a sponsor? That's direction number one. Do you want to get a group? That's direction number two. Do you want to come to the meetings? Direction number three. Do you want to do that? If you want to do that, make up your mind. That's how you will live. That's how you will live. Your will in your life. It's that simple in the beginning. I hear people making a very big deal out of this step. It is not that big a deal. It is not a major, giant step. It is a step. It is an ordinary step. It's number three. I don't think any one step in Alcoholics Anonymous is any more important than any other step. But 
the 12 and 12 does say to us that the effectiveness of our entire program depends upon how well we are able to incorporate this step, the third step, into our lives. And so that's really the question. How will you live? Independence that all of us pride ourselves on, self-reliance, which I certainly prided myself on, self-sufficiency, is all very well, up to a point. And then it kills you if you're not alcoholic. And so the, fo the, the focus here really is to turn dependence upon oneself, which in the past has proven unsuccessful. That's it. The big book says the one thing at the beginning, it says, be convinced we were at step three. Just what did we do and how did we go about it? They tell you exactly what to do in the fifth chapter following the, the introduction that John read. It says the first thing we have to be convinced that a life based on self-will is not a success. And that I was convinced of because I was convinced that my life was unmanageable. Because I was powerless over alcohol, because I had exerted self-will for all of those years. Being convinced, it says. So I made this decision, and the decision says we give it to the care of God. We ask God to care for us. I hear people in Alcoholics Anonymous, they talk about this step, and I sometimes wonder what they are talking about. They give their will to God on Tuesday, they take it back on Wednesday. I gave him my will, then I seem to have taken it back. If they really gave it to him in the first place, I could just see God up there, you know. O'Keefe wants his will back. <laughs> yeah, bring him up here, we'll talk. You know? But they do this, and then other people are, are involved, they have God involved in the minutiae of their lives. They don't, God tells them whether they should buy regular or, or, or premium gasoline. You know, or they expect God to go to work for them. I didn't go to work today. It must be God's will that I'm not supposed to work today. Yeah. It's also God's will you're going to get fired tomorrow. And I hope you starve. We're asking God to have a care for us. We're not asking him to come in and, and run our lives. We're asking him to have a care. Have a care for us. And I try to develop in this step, the beginnings at least, of some measure of God dependence. Being dependent upon God. Because I got hope in the second step. And in the third step, I think I picked up some faith. Based upon experience. I hear the expression of times used in AA of blind faith. I don't have blind faith in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't have blind faith in anything. I have faith in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe it works because it works. And because I've seen it work in my life. And in the lives of many, many other people who I've known in Alcoholics Anonymous, in the lives of members of my family who are members of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have seen this work. I know it works. That's why I have faith. Not, I'm not blind. I'm only blind about it. I understand. I understand what it means. And I become dependent upon God because I have asked him to have a care for me, to have a concern for me. I don't limit God as best I can. I don't put any limits on him. I tell him every day. I tell him that I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am still an alcoholic and I need his help. And I want him to have a care for me. Have a concern for me. I ask him, please, have a concern for me. After a discussion in the, in the big book about the willfulness of it all, and they give us the illustration of the stage director, they get down to the real working of the third step, and it turns out that it is a prayer. They give it to us in the form of a prayer. And the prayer itself, uh, when I first encountered the prayer, I wasn't happy with the these and the thous. It just reminded me too much of uh, the religion of my parents, and I didn't like it. But I say it every day, and I put in the these and the thous. Because that's the way they gave it to us. And I don't think I'm empowered to change anything around here. And that prayer, which is in the big book, says, I offer myself to you to do with me as you will. 
I offer myself. It's not demanding anything of God. You say to God, I offer myself to you. Here I am. I offer myself to you to do with me whatever you will. Relieve me of the bondage of self. The most important thing that has ever happened to me is that my bondage of self has been eased up. I remain self-willed at many times. I am still egocentric all the time. But it's eased up. I, I want to be rid of the bondage of self. Take away my difficulties, it says. That victory over them will give evidence to those I would help of your power. The purpose of the step in asking to be re relieved of the difficulties is that so we can be an example to the new person. And my difficulties are my character defects. And if a new person comes in and they're having a problem, you say, well, I had that problem. I used to have that problem. It's gone away now, or it's much less than now. You give them hope because you have experience. And because you have experience and you give them hope, you both get strength. And that's what we share here. Experience, strength, and hope. And the prayer ends, may I do your will always. I think it's a very effective prayer because it really isn't demanding anything from God. It's not asking him for anything material. It's simply indicating to him your availability as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, that you have made a decision, that you're going to be a member, not a tourist, not some guy who's floating through here, who's coming by to enjoy the scenery. You know, we're all familiar here with the, with the tourists and the suburbs, and they'll be coming in a few months. And they enjoy the sunshine for a week or two while they're here. And they look the sights over, and it's very nice. And they see the beach, and they go around. And they drive weird. And after two weeks, they go back. And they hope they go back with a tan so they can show their friends they were here. But the tan goes away. I was a snowbird for many years. The tan goes away in a couple of weeks. And they're back in the ground. They've been here. They've been in this beautiful place but they're not a member here. They don't live here. They haven't been here in September. You don't see them flocking around in, in August. <laughs> they don't live here. And people treat AA sometimes that way. They come here like the snowbirds. They come. They benefit. They get their tan. And then they go out and they freeze. This prayer indicates that we're going to be members. And we're turning this making this decision to do this, to give our lives, our lives, which are unmanageable. What you, what's your life when you first came in here? That's some life you get. You give you didn't give up anything. Are you kidding me? I mean, I don't think the guy who picks up the garbage would have taken my life. Oh, Keith, why have a little? Thank you. I got my own. I'm doing great. <laughs> I don't need his. Not, not in that shape. It could be somebody else's. We didn't give up anything, really. We got rid of something. We didn't give up drinking. We got rid of that. It was killing us. It's like the guy that jumps in the lake holding on to that big boulder. And he's going down. He's drowning. Everybody's yelling, let go of the rock, Charlie. No, he holds on. That was me with the boots. Every power greater than my, my own that I dealt with told me, give up the drinking. No, no. It's not the drinking. It's something else. And then I got here, and I, I knew I was powerless. I came to believe, and I made this decision. The decision says we give it to God as we understand him. One of the truly inspired thoughts of Alcoholics Anonymous, God, is you understand him. A lot of people have trouble with God. They have trouble. When I say they have trouble with God, they really have trouble, I think, with the God of their parents, the God of their birth the God of their schooling, the God that someone else gave them. You know, they wake up one time, they're seven years old, and they find out they're a Methodist. You know? Nobody asked them about it. No voting or anything. You know, I, I, was, I was minding my own business pretty good in the neighborhood <clears throat> until about the fifth grade. and uh, I mean, the fifth year, my fifth year, you know, I'm five years old. And... Uh, 
One morning, my sister said, you're coming with me, and I went up with her. She was going to school up the street, and they parked me in the school. I found out I was a Roman Catholic. Nobody had asked me about it, but there I was, and I was a big nun standing up there with a ruler, and uh, she got replaced for the next eight years with another one with a bigger ruler. Around the fourth grade, I think, I don't, you know, this is not right. <laughs> they got me in here with these sadists. They're beating me on the head with rulers. It's a great religion. But nobody asked me about it. <clears throat> and I had, I went through that whole system. I went through grammar school, high school, college, law school, all Roman Catholic schools. And they were on, I don't knock that church because uh, they did a great deal for me. They really did. They educated me. Most of every school I went to was free. They took care of me. They took good care of me. And they educated me and they helped me. The trouble was, I just didn't believe in that religion. I was smart enough not to tell them that when they would give me the free education. And when I was finished with that system, I had a very clear understanding of their understanding. You understand? I knew and I understood what they knew and they understood. And every month they would ask me, Do you understand? They give me a test. And I'd write it down, they say, he understands. I had a very clear understanding of somebody else's understanding of God. But it wasn't my understanding of that. It was God as my mother understood him. It was God as Sister Mary Alice understood him. It was God as the Pope understood him. But it wasn't God as I understood him. I never heard it. That concept blew me away when I came here. I dug in a little. I told John, I said, I don't go to church, you know that. He said, nothing to do with church. God is, you understand it. And I really gave that some thought in the beginning <clears throat> of this uh, because I wanted to, to have an understanding. And I don't think this term requires, this step requires that I understand God. I don't think anybody understands God. I think this step requires for me to come to terms with the notion of God, to come to terms with the idea of God, what it means to me, not what it meant to my mother or my father or my church, but what does it mean to you, to come to terms with this notion, that when I use this word God, I have a, an understanding of what I'm referring to. Because I knew from reading ahead that I'm going to need this term. I'm going to have to understand what I'm doing. If I'm making this kind of a decision, I better understand who I'm asking to have a care for my will in my life. I have to have an understanding of that. Come to terms. And of course, my understanding is my understanding. It's not going to do you any good. I will tell you well, what I finally came to in the beginning, of course, was very simple. I knew that my sponsor was a sober member of Alcoholic, or Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew that my sponsor uh, was sober, was happy, and had all of the benefits of this program. And he had been a member for maybe 10 years or so by the time I got here. And I seriously wanted what he had. And he was the first power greater than my own that I really acknowledged. I believed in my sponsor. I believed in my group. <laughs> I believed in Alcoholics Anonymous. And Alcoholics Anonymous in the beginning was the God of my understanding. I figured this program is truly the work of God, as I understand God. And this is saving my life by now. I had maybe a year. And I liked it here. And that's good enough for me. And then as I stayed a little longer, I thought, well, even if Alcoholics Anonymous is an enormous power greater than my own, all of its membership in those days, maybe they had, we had 200,000 members. Now we have 2 million. Surely I thought there is a power greater than Alcoholics Anonymous. And I came to a conventional notion of God. And this, again, is the God of my understanding. And how I worked it out, and I just tell you this because this is how I worked it out in my own head. I don't know if this will help you, but I, I think of it this way still. Well, my father died when I was about two, two and a half. So I never had a father. But I have a lot of children, so I have experience at being a father. And 
when we close this meeting tonight, we will pray a prayer. And the first two words of that prayer summarizes the God of my understanding, our Father. I came to an understanding that God would uh, would operate with me like a father. And I understood something of what it was to, to be a father. I know from my experience that if one of my children asked me for something, I have probably said no much more than I have said yes over the course of having seven children. I have probably said no. I know I have said no to such items as motorcycles, trips to Europe, automobiles, money, get me out of jail, that kind of stuff. I have said no more than I have said yes. That doesn't mean I don't like them. I have a care for them. I have a concern for them. And I have said yes when I thought it was appropriate that the answer be yes. I certainly have not insisted that I run their lives. I have not made a decision about how they live or where they will live or how they will live. They make that decision. And I have a care for that. And I think that is the God of my understanding, our Father. He's your Father. He's my Father. We say that prayer at every meeting. It is a perfect prayer, which is no surprise considering its author. And that has the God of my understanding. So I make that decision. When I say that prayer in the morning, I talk to our Father just as I would hope one of my children would talk to me. And I say, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm starting off this day, and I offer myself to you to do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I might better do your will. And it's, uh, it's been working all my life. And this decision that I made, <clears throat> it never required me to join a religion. It's not necessary. It didn't require me to get into some cult. I didn't have to uh, wear any distinctive costume. I didn't have to put anything on my head. I didn't have to get a ritual tattoo. I didn't have to do anything out of the ordinary except come here and be with you and renew that decision on a daily basis. And truly, this was the key that opened the door to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I was just about the usual kind of pigeon. I, I went over this with my sponsor. I went over with him on a number of occasions. We talked about it. He urged me not to make such a big deal of it. He said it wasn't such a big thing. If I would make up my mind to stay here and to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, I said, I'm going to stay. I figured that would really excite him a lot. He said, great, wonderful, you're going to stay. Good, he said, well, start an inventory. She said, why should I do that? He said, I thought you were going to stay here and be a member. I said, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm staying. I'm a member. Count me in. You know, and uh, if there's ever a fundraising or something, let me know, and I'll chip right in. No problem at all. Chip right in there. He said, good, write an inventory. I said, why? He said, forget it. Go get drunk. I had been a member for about a minute, and I was asserting myself. I had, been, I had made this very, very big decision, and the next thing I did was dig in. You know, I didn't want to be that kind of a member. I don't want to get too fully involved, but that's next week. But basically, making this decision means that I'm going to follow instructions. And like any alcoholic worthy of the name, the one thing I never was quite able to do in any area was follow the instructions. Remember those toys you had to buy for the kids at Christmas? And it had, came with the instructions? That was the first thing I threw out with the box was the instructions. Then it was a big mumble. Some of my kids are telling me, I say, here, put this together. You'll have a good time with it. <laughs> if you can follow the... I didn't follow directions well. I didn't, the way they would come and say, don't touch that plate, it's hot. <laughs> put my finger on it. And that's because of the willfulness and the selfishness and the self-centeredness of the alcoholic. And that's the way I, I managed to live. But this is different. I, get, I follow directions here. I 
follow directions here because I was better motivated. The directions here, I thought, would save my life. And it turned out to be that way. So if you're new and you're looking this over, it's not that big a deal. It's not a giant step, as we used to say in that children's game. It's really a baby step. It's a small step, and you can do this. You don't have to give up anything to anybody. You don't have to transfer your mind or your life or your will or anything like that. But you have to make a decision whether you want to stay here or not stay here. And it is my experience that if you make that decision, as you will, if you want to live, see, when we're drinking or not drinking, that's in the beginning. That's in the beginning of your drinking career. Somebody says, have a drink. You say, yeah, all right. You make a decision. Yeah, I'll have that drink. Now, the only time I ever turned down a drink, I completely misunderstood the question. <laughs> but there was a point in my life where I could say, I, that's it. You know, I got to go home now. I've had three. I'm going home. And I would go home. I could do that once. That that ended. There came a point where I just couldn't do that. So I had no, no choice, really, but to drink or not drink. But by the time I got here, the question had changed. It was no longer a question of whether I would drink or not drink. The question now is whether I would live or die. That was the question. It became a much more serious matter. Because I had physical problems, I had great mental problems, and I was spiritually devastated. It wasn't a question now of choosing, should I have a drink or should I not have a drink? My sponsor was a tough guy. We had a fellow in the group said, I feel like drinking. He said, why don't you buy a gun and shoot yourself? It's easy. That was his answer. The manager, the great psychiatrist, says that we are committing suicide slowly. He classifies alcoholism in his book on the mind. It's in the, it's in the chapter on suicide. And that's the difference when, when I got here. It wasn't a question of drinking or not drinking anymore. It was a question of living or dying. And something happens here. You know, they come, I came into here. Now, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, there really weren't that many hospitals around. A lot of the hospitals in my area would not accept an alcoholic as a patient, as an alcoholic. We'd have to put him in for something else, gastritis, enteritis, something. And we got real dirty, wet drunks then. Now, of course, they come around, they're sanitized. And they've been dusted off. Everybody's out of Happy Dale or Floating Hill or something. <laughs> they've had 28 days and $20,000 of somebody's money, not their own, because they're still alcoholics. And, uh, they're all dusted off. You know, and uh, they, they come in here, and they're marvelous. And I'm happy to see them, but it's sometimes those type, that type of fellow that comes doesn't understand that he's almost dead. Sometimes the, the fact that they have been hospitalized and taken care of and medicated and turned loose, they think, I wasn't so bad. I wasn't so bad. Because I came here once. I stayed 10 months and I don't know what was going on in my mind. I know I did pick up a drink and that's the bottom line. But I think probably before I picked up that drink, I was thinking along the lines, well, it wasn't so bad. No, that wasn't so bad. I wasn't in that bad of shape because I'd gotten a lot of things back in the 10-month period. It was only when I went back out that I found out about alcohol. Alcohol is one of the best friends that Alcoholics Anonymous ever had. Alcohol is a great 12-step agent. You get some new fellow who wants to dig in, tell him to drink. He'll find out about alcohol. You don't want to do an inventory bunkie? <laughs> Have a martini, pal. Have two. Had a fellow in New York who was digging in. His wife said, I don't know what to do with him. I said, buy him a case. Get him to stop all that sneaking and sipping. Get him good and drunk. Fill him up with it. Alcohol will do that for us. And that was the decision I had to make. Either come over here and live sensibly with direction for my sponsor or go back to, to where I came from. And I couldn't do that because my life was unmanageable. How could I go back to where I came from? So I made a decision in the form of a prayer. Later on in 
the book, it says that they found it helpful to take this step with some other person, and I've done that. I've taken the third step with my sponsor, and I've taken it with people who I sponsor. So if you're like I am, if you're convinced that your life is unmanageable, that you're powerless over alcohol, if you come to believe that there is a power greater than your own, that there's help in Alcoholics Anonymous, then make a decision to turn over your will and your life to the care of the God as you understand him. And if you can do that, you've done the third step. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.